Okay. Um, are we ready? Mm -hmm. Ready when you are. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. And thank you, Sue, for hosting this two-day conference um, on Divorce Support Week. It's been really insightful and actually quite inspiring to listen to all the speakers yesterday. And I'm really honored to be part of it. My name is Lydia Campbell, and I'm a health coach specializing in midlife transition. I'm also a divorce recovery coach. I'm honored to share my insights of my transformative journey through divorce. Um, let me take you on a personal journey. This is an evolutionary tale of transition through divorce. A journey that began with a disorientating upheaval of divorce, but ultimately led to a profound sense of discovery and growth. As I navigated the tumultuous terrain of divorce, I found myself grappling with trauma, depression, and disorientation. I found that the coping mechanisms that once served me no longer provided solace leaving me adrift in a sea of uncertainty. But it was in this darkness that I stumbled upon a profound realization. Even though painful and disorientating, transition of divorce held within it a seed of transformation. I'm just going to say, I hope you don't mind that I'm looking at my notes as I give this talk. So I'll be looking over to my right um, as we speak. I hope that's okay. What to expect. After a short introduction of what transition at divorce taught me about my notion of self, I'll then start with the end in mind. Now that's a phrase that William Bridges uses in his book, Transitions. All transitions start with an ending. And then we go into the middle part of the talk, which is the main focus of the ideas I want to share about the deep work of transition on identity. And the final part of the talk will be about the pathway to a new beginning. Um, I just need to move the gallery because I can't see part of my slides. I lost my cursor. There we go. Can't move it. Oh dear. I'm losing the last bit of my slide, but you can all see it, hopefully. Um, so let's start with an introduction. How often as coaches have you come across clients who are experiencing separation and divorce say, I don't feel, I don't like, don't feel like myself anymore. I don't want to feel like this. What's wrong with me? And how long will this feeling last? The challenging answer is it will last as long as you want. But the more compassionate, compassionate answer is it will last as long as you need. How, ex how one experiences transition is determined by a number of things. One, if you intimated the change or if it was forced upon you. Two, how tied you are to the roles and expectations of your previous life. And three, your tolerance for discomfort. Divorce entails letting go of so much. Physical, psychological, tangible and intangible beliefs and behaviors that no longer serve you in your new life. But how do we let go? It's a process. And it's a process that starts with a belief. It's a belief that there's something more and that there's meaning to your story. Viktor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning says, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning. My story, starts with the predictably and very similar from what I've seen in my coaching clients, a profound sense 
of a feeling that there's something wrong with me. And with no tools to process a reality that's upside down, apart from recreating my post-divorce reality, I really couldn't answer the questions, who am I and what do I want to do? There were layers to the depths of my feelings. I felt entirely dismantled in a way that nobody could really relate to. There was something that had been dislodged on a soul level. And the most agonizing pain though, didn't stem from the divorce itself. It originated from a deeper internal source within me. And all my friends, therapists, counselors that I've spoken to, you know, would say, well, that's very understandable given what you've been through and that you were married for so long. But it just didn't seem as simple as that. I instinctively knew that there was something more. It felt like there was a present from my past that had been trailing me and waiting for just the opportune moment to surface. And no matter what I did or where I turned, it persisted, it demanded my attention. And this, this was the area that I needed to explore. And this was the truth that begged exploration. I'm enormously grateful for experiencing something more comprehensive than mere change in my own divorce story. Because without searching for it, and actually, in fact, almost missing it, the transition of divorce gifted me an opportunity to shift my notion of self and to define what life actually meant. I was able to travel from the initial dislocation of my identity to a self-authoring position that was previously unable, unavailable to me. That was the gift of my divorce transition. So we're going to start with the end in mind, and that's a quote that comes from William Bridges' book, Transitions. We typically don't like endings. We, they're sad, there's a sense of loss. Um, and William Bridges says in his book that unless you have dealt with endings, unless they've been processed, you will carry them into your present. So I think this is a great place to start. Um, and of course, there is a grieving process. Um, we've all heard of the Kubler-Ross cycle, and we go through that, and sometimes repetitively. But in his book, William Bridges has bro bro broken down endings into five distinct categories. The first one is disengagement, and this is where we there's a withdrawal from the a break from the known reality. And then there's dismantle, and that is the raw mechanics of breaking apart the separation. And then we've got disidentification, again, not identifying the roles and the, and the position that we were in previously. Disenchantment is about starting to question the assumptions and the values that we held previously. And disorientation, number five, is probably the, the, the most unpleasant, because this is where we lose sight of the future. Um, but it serves a vital purpose. It's, it's the next step into the middle part of my talk and the middle part of transition where um, it's the start of a deepening state of attention. But I just want to focus just for a minute and go a bit further into disengagement because I find it it's the most violent of endings for some people. And I called it dislocation because divorce dislocates us from our axis. And this can involve a complex rebuild and it may require new parts. It may require um, complete reassembly. Uh, so it's, it's the part that actually, I just want to delve down a little bit deeper into it. A quote from William Bridges, we break connection in the setting which we have come to know ourselves and leave behind the sense of being. And being able to describe this part of the journey as dislocation may sound like dramatic language. But for me, it was the correct expression I was feeling emotionally. It's painful language. It's painful language to describe the ensuing trauma. Expressing tension, emotional tension through language I found was the first and really helpful step in healing. I found that through coaching a lot of clients, they hit the mute button at this point. And 
they silence their voice, not reaching out for help um, and perhaps dismissing or diminishing their experience uh, to conform with expectations um, of what's believed and, and what's accepted. But there's a danger in this, I found, and which is those who diminish their voice for a period of time may have trouble conjuring it up when needed. So for me, language and voice is really important. It immediately, um, I can't admit someone who's in the way, okay, fine, I thought I was the host for a minute. Language and voice is so important. It immediately translates emotion into expression and the expression can then be thought about and examined and it's the first place to start to make sense of what's happening. And as coaches, our job is to encourage our clients to find their voice and use their voice to communicate how they feel so they don't get trapped in the emotion. Language is a tool and voice is the actioning of that tool. It's in this critical state of dislocation that we need to help develop thinking tools to make sense of this stage of life. So the takeaway here is that is if whatever we can do to encourage this voice, if it's journaling, talking therapies, meditation, a deep sense of listening, um, these are all useful tools, thinking tools to really examine um, what's happening, the, the frightening, painful part of what's happening. Now, just moving on to the middle part of the talk, this is navigating the in-between. I've called it the space of potential. William Bridges calls it the neutral zone. Other people have called it the second stage or the gap. But um, this is the most uncomfortable place between where we were and where we want to be, and probably from where we are. And here we get to do the work. Here we get to address the discomfort of being in the transi transitional phase where old structures have dissolved, but new ones are not yet formed. This is where the magic happens. It's an unsettling time. And we can we have to make a decision. It's a decision to stick or twist. And what one huge benefit of this phase is that the fluidity of it can grant people the freedom to innovate. But it's terrifying. It's a terrifying place. And we do everything we can, and I've seen it with clients and myself, to avoid sitting in the gap. But we need to pay attention here. There is a reason where all the major religions and faith practices across the world say embrace the stillness. Christianity says be still and know, and the Zen practices say move towards the resistance. Because this is where we can turn down the noise and pay deep attention. There's a choice. You can stick with the familiar and stay in a comfort zone and, you know, this is not a judgment. People do, and sometimes people need to. But the path of growth is in the parts we're resisting. This is the time that we can process endings. This is where we can recalibrate our identities and try new forms of being. I found there are, two, there are four main areas for work here which can lead to self-authoring. I found that confrontation, creativity, communication, and connections, I'll just go through them quickly. We have to confront, um, we have to confront that navigating the in-between calls for something that, something meaningful that confronts our inherent resistance to change. At this point, I spun out like a whirling dervish, trying to do everything I could to avoid confronting the loss of meaning in my life. But the opposite was true. When I was forced to stop and sit, floods of realization overwhelmed me. Connection. Connection, both emotionally and spiritual, flooded the space which had been created between what was and now. Deepening relationships with my children and with people who were really there for me really started to deepen. 
creativity was the most helpful at this point because I had to start thinking out of the box. I had to start thinking differently. I needed an extra income. And it was in this space that I was able to envisage converting my redundant garage into a, a rental space. And this is a time where I advise clients to think creatively at every aspect of their lives, whether it's their health, whether it's their community activities, you know, solo traveling, that was something that I really embraced. Um, and the final one is communication. At this really turbulent time, I find it really helpful to have a press statement, if you like, and let people know exactly what you're going through and where you are. It really helps mitigating being re-traumatized or having to really experience things that your body just can't experience at the moment. In summary, of that stage, it's impossible to control change, but it is possible to manage transition. Just going to drill down into the difference between change versus transition. Without transition, I've heard it say that change is merely rearranging the furniture. The transition involves stepping into uncertainty, even when the future remains unclear. It, it's about uncharted territory, including the internal uncharted territory and external. It's a deliberate choice to explore our assumptions about capacity, values, and belief. Change is situational. It's the external events and the circumstances that disrupt our lives leaving us longing for fam familiarity and stability. Lots of people at divorce look at their immediate past for an answer for what to do next and make changes that are familiar to them. But transition happens when there's a shift in what holds value and meaning to you. It took a series of changes to kickstart my transitional journey. I moved from the city I'd lived in with my family for nearly 30 years to be next to my aging parents. I left behind my home, my community, and my adult children. I felt that this was a massive transition. I soon realized that I had changed one full-time caring role um, where I was more or less invisible to a very similar reality. And this was followed by a series of realizations that I no longer had the capacity to be in that role. It was in that unhappy place that for the first time, I began to challenge my expectations, the assumptions that had formed my identity. I chose to let go of a main assumption that had defined me from my earliest childhood. And that was, I had made my sense of worth based on whether I was useful or whether I was being needed. That role had become redundant and it was one that I was no longer comfortable with. So just note, it wasn't the first change of divorce or the change of location, um, but the realization that the underlying meaning of those changes had and said, had on me and said about who I was that triggered my transition. I hope that's clear. So it wasn't the changes, but it was what those changes meant in my new role that actually kickstarted my transition and made me think about my identity. So to summarize that, transition is psychological. It's the inner journey of reorientation and self redefinition that we must undergo to incorporate the changes meaningfully into our lives. Transition is less process driven. Dan Sullivan, who is the founder of Strategic Coach and the author of many books, has a quadrant um, that he calls the four C's and it's commitment, courage, capability, and confidence. 
And he, I've heard him speak where he says that he applies this quadrant to almost every area of our lives. And so in this talk, I thought it would be useful to talk about how one can build on certain um, processes through this transition to lead to confidence and a new sense of self-worth. So if we commit to the process of change, and this includes grieving, really processing the ending, which includes recognition and radical acceptance, we can courageously start to interrogate the assumptions of our past and we can choose conscious exploration. This capability then, this builds capability step by step and day by day, and which leads to confidence in one's newfound strength and ability. So just to really map it out, the pathway to transition and transformation starts with a trigger. And in life, as we know, they have many triggers. Um, uh, could be a diagnosis, losing one's job, parents aging, menopause, um, and of course, divorce. And all triggers produce a change. A lot of people stop there. But for others, the realization and the belief in the possibility for more enables them to endure the discomfort to accommodate a new narrative beyond what they previously thought was possible. And as a coach, I'm a if I'm able to give clients the tools to understand what's happening in the moment of upheaval, they're going to be able to reach forward. And that's what I was able to do. And that's what we all need to do. We all need to be constantly be, I think, in moments of uncertainty, instead of pulling back, we need to be, move forward. But in order to do that, we need to have the tools and the support. And when we go through transition, we're moving to a new place where we rely on different inputs to define our expectations and definitions of who we are. We have to turn up the volume of things that mean new things that mean things new things to us. And we turn down the volume on aspects that now not relevant or not as relevant to where we are. This exploration leads to a new sense of ownership over one's future. Um, but this requires a choice, an informed choice to delve deep into our assumptions about ourselves and our values. This process, if fully undertaken, undertaken <clears throat> leads to unwavering confidence in our ability to navigate the unknown. This um, has now, this confidence has been given a name and it's now known as post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is a theory that explains transformation following trauma. It was developed by psychologists in the mid 1990s and holds that people who endure psychological hardship, people who endure psychological struggle following adversity can often see positive growth afterwards. People develop new understanding of themselves and a new meaning to their place in the world and how to relate with other people and the kind of future they want to have and a better understanding of how they want to live. <clears throat> Psychologists now have a new way of measuring um, evidence of post-traumatic growth. And I'm just putting after divorce because this is what I experienced, <clears throat> excuse me, a fresh appreciation for life. Divorce often brings a renewed gratitude for life's simple joys. Relationship with others, you might find deeper connections and appreciations of loved ones, new possibilities in life. After one's gone through the whole process, there's a personal growth, which gives you the confidence to try new things um, and self-discovery. Personal strength, the challenges of divorce can reveal inner resilience um, and spiritual change. It sometimes prompts a shift in our value systems and spiritual perspectives. Um, so in summary, the abrupt shift from a shared identity when one goes through divorce 
um, to separate into separate identities can disrupt our sense of self. We need to develop tools that can help us reflect on the internal struggle, guiding us towards genuine growth and adaptive transformation in a world that can so easily and rapidly change. Um, marriage involves integrating separate individuals into a single pair and divorce explicitly involves a return to separate identities. We decouple so much from everything that's familiar when we transition, it's unknown territory. Our bodies react to that instability in a lot of ways. However, the journey to return to oneself after divorce can give one courage, confidence, and capabilities that we didn't realize were within us. And this can be used to energize and spark and empower a new definition of ourselves. And we can also encourage others. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Lydia Campbell. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Lydia. That was a very enlightening presentation. I've not seen it put that way before. That's really good. Thank Has you. anyone got any questions? No. No. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing everyone else's. I had a question. Oh, Sally, yes. Hi, hi. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Lydia, when you have a client who is in that stage of not being ready to move forward um, and yet is still trying to move forward with their divorce, what's your sort of... Um, what what are your strategies to to support them in at, at that moment? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's a process, and I I did say I had said and I had thought about how you know one has to be very careful not to place judgment mm -hmm. on people's timing and readiness yeah. to move forward. I mean, I think what I was trying to be really explicit about is there is a difference, not that one is right or one is wrong, mm -hmm. but there is a difference mm -hmm. that one shouldn't confuse change with transition because we use them interchangeably. Yeah. Um, so I think I would just be with where the client was mm -hmm. and, I, and, you know, reassure them that, it, 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 you know, it depends. For me, it was with clients who were saying, how long is this going to last? Being really impatient and wanting to move on. So I think the whole idea of my journey is is simply, and, and some of the people I've been with, is simply that my journey and is not universal. But um, moving forward with the divorce is really the second stage, as Jeff Bridges says, of the ending, which mm. is dismantling. Mm -hmm. you know and so one has to do the mechanics of dismantling and you know just do that as a mechanical process you yeah. know so that's that's yeah. what i would, that's what i would um support them with yeah okay thank you thank you thanks so much anyone else got a question if not i shall stop the recording